Ron Sexsmith's debut novel is called Dear Life. He joins me now in our Toronto studio. Hi, Ron. Hey, Tom. Welcome back to Toronto. Thank you. Nice to be back. Yeah, a little stressful, though, too, you know. I mean, I keep wondering, when they, when are they going to finish it, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, it just seems, I mean, there's always a lot of construction, but it just seems kind of maybe more intense or something. We'll try know? and build it up so you come back. Right? Thank you. Uh, yeah. in, in the foreword to Dear Life, you write that this idea came to you in a, in a dream in the morning, and I always find the morning dreams are the better dreams. Yeah. Uh, can you take me back to that moment? How like how fully formed was this story? Oh, not not very formed at all. I mean, it was one of those, like, you know, when you wake up and you're not quite ready to get out of bed, so you doze back to sleep, and you, then you wake up three hours later. It was, it was one of those... Um, those sort of situations, and and I just felt like I'd seen um, like a trailer for a movie or something. And I remember telling my wife about it, and saying I saw this kind of this fairy tale type thing. And I, I wondered if it was actually something I'd read already. And for the longest time, I just kept thinking, well, this would be a really good movie. And so whenever I would I would run into um, an actor friend, I have some actor friends, I would say, hey, what do you think of this? And you know, but then it would just lie there, you know, because what are they going to do? Oh, yeah, let's make that movie, you know. So for the longest time, I just didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't until late, I think, 2014 when a fellow at Penguin, I think I even say it in there, but um, he'd heard a rumor that I had a, a book idea, which I didn't I didn't even know I had a book idea. I just had this, mm-hmm. this vague idea. Again, it reminds me of when you write songs, you know, you, you, you have this idea for a song and you start playing it and you go, oh, is this someone else? Like, am I just playing yeah. someone else's song? That happens all the time. But I, but actually in those, I don't know if it's a morning dream, whatever you want to call it, but I've had so many song ideas in that same time frame mm-hmm. where you wake up or even, you know, I do these stupid jokes on Twitter. Sometimes I'll get one of those. They're not stupid, Ron. They're well, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> They're fantastic <laughs> comedy, dad jokes comedy on Comedy gold, yeah. Yeah. No, but... Um, so it was just, I mean, the last thing I, I wanted to do really was write a book. I mean, I didn't think I could write a book. So the thing I guess I'm mostly proud of is the fact that I did it because a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to write a book, and they just they never do because it's hard, right? And um, so I'm just glad I stuck with it. You know? You've written a lot of songs. Uh, yeah, I mean, Did, uh, I haven't counted. I'm probably around three, 400 or something. Does that help you write a novel? Um, it wasn't a... a, a didn't help me a great deal because, um, I mean, with songwriting as hard as it is, it's a lot easier because, you know, you have uh, repetition. You mm-hmm. can it's okay to repeat the first verse if you want to. Mm-hmm. It's and only about three minutes, four three minutes, three minutes, right? and the melody carries it along. Like you can have a great first verse and base your whole second verse on that. You know, using a similar rhyming scheme or something like that. So it was very different um, because. I didn't have anyone really to bounce it off. I was writing, all I had was the, the books that I'd loved growing up reading. And, you know, so all along the way, I would have these questions. Well, is it, is it okay to put this in brackets? Or can I, you know, am I taking too long to get to the thing? Or, so, um, and it was like 16 drafts before I finished but, it. But the reason I ask is because I know that in to, to write to write Dear Life, you, you had to put yourself inside a lot of different characters' viewpoints. Yeah. And and uh, I wonder if that, that happens in your songwriting as well, that you inhabit other characters. Um, probably not as much, although I tend to write like a lot of songwriters. It's, it's not totally confessional, but, but I, I, I'm in a lot of my songs or I'm writing about either something I've overheard or something that's on my mind. But I'm definitely in... In this book, you know, I'm definitely in a, in a few of the characters, and um, how so? Well, I just could relate, like to the main character Darren, I, the awkwardness of him. You know, <laughs> I could relate. And actually, there's two characters, Darren and a character named Craig Grimsby, who are almost like the same character at different stages of life. They're both. Um, there's a lot of um, parallels to their story, and and I sort of related <clears throat> to to both of them. Um, and at the same time, the characters of Darren and his mom were sort of loosely based on one of my best friends uh, growing up in St. Catharines who lived with his mom in this small house. And I was over there all the time because it, it felt really free over there, you know. Like mm-hmm. It was just they were they were more, felt more like best friends than mom and daughter. Yeah, yeah. So they did all sorts of things together. And I does mean, she know? Has she seen the book? Oh, she's passed on now. But oh, this was, uh, she was 
she was sort of an older mother, you know? No, like, but your, your friend. I'm oh, my friend's still alive. Yeah, yeah has, she, has, has she seen the book? Oh, it's a he, actually. Oh, he, I thought you said mother and daughter. Oh, no, my, sorry, mother and son. His <clears throat> name's, uh, well, he actually changed his name recently, but he I ran into him just this year uh, in Victoria, of all places. Uh, I hadn't seen him in almost 20 years. But um, I didn't tell him that, though. I didn't tell him that. Oh, I, uh, although he'd heard I, I had a book coming out, so maybe he'll see himself in there. What's, yeah. the, what's the most surprising thing you found while writing a novel? Well, the most surprising thing for me was how immersed I got in, you know, um, I'd be writing, my wife would check check up on me from time to time, and, and I wouldn't even know she was there. I'd be totally, you know, in the town, I'd see the town, I'd see the people, and like I was saying at another interview, you know, a character's arm would go up and my arm would go up, and, <laughs> you know, and, and it was just really <clears throat> trance-like, um, and uh, so... Yeah. What was the question? I think I answered it, right? I know. I think, yeah, you, I yeah. think you definitely yeah. answered it. And, and, and my next question is, I inadvertently called it a novel. It's not so, as much of a novel as it is. sort of a fairy tale in so many ways. Oh, it's more of a fairy tale. Yeah. Why, why were you attracted to fairy tales? Um, well, I've always loved fairy tales, but it, it, for this, it was mostly because that's sort of what presented itself to me. It just seemed like a fairy tale when they, you know, uh, the, the, the initial arc was very simple. It was just a, uh, I saw this, I caught a glimpse of this story of a boy who accidentally kills a dog that belongs to a witch. So that was pretty much all I had, which I just thought, well, that's right out of Brothers Grimm or something. Yeah, you know? and were you reading the Brothers Grimm? Were you reading those old kind of fairy oh, yeah. tales when you were a kid? As a kid, for sure. Yeah. And I loved Hans Christian Andersen a lot. What do you love about them? Um, I, there's something about fairy tales that resonate in a sort of unexpected way, in a ch sort of a childhood way. What do you mean? Well, it's like, let's say like the Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen was one of my favorite of his no, books. When is that again? The one where it's like there's these two friends and um, it, it's kind of hard to explain, but at, at the beginning uh, there's this mirror that gets smashed and all the shards of the mirror fall into people's eyes and turn them cold, you mm -hmm. know? And so there's these two, the boy and a girl, I can't remember their names, but they're best friends. And all of a sudden the boy turns cold and the Snow Queen comes to town and he f follows her and she spends the whole book looking for her friend. Right. But just the thought that someone, a close friend, could turn cold <clears throat> and the friendship could be, or people could change, was, was something that was very, I don't know, it just... It, it was like a real threat or something that that could happen, and um, I don't know. I mean, there, 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 there's the the good and evil thing that's in I think most fairy tales. Mm. That um, it's just the the kind of construction uh, uh, that makes sense. I think in a uh, just some deep way, you know, it's it's how the world maybe should be or something. I also love how dark some of those fairy tales are. Yeah, and, and that was actually if my my one, um, or maybe not my one, but w w one of the, the things that, that I wish I could have, you know, I didn't have the equipment to do was I wanted it to be scarier in certain places, you know. Like where I was, you, you wish it was. You wish even the book now was scarier. Yeah, I think I did the best I could. For a songwriter, wrote a book, but I know there were different. <laughs> you know, well, there were points in the where I, as I was writing, right, where I, I wanted it to be moody or scarier, but I didn't, didn't quite know how to do that. Why did you want it to be moody or scarier? Just just because uh, I personally like that. I love reading. Uh, I remember one of my favorite books was this one called Something Wicked This Way Comes, and I remember reading it at two stages of my life, reading it as a teenager and then reading it again as a in my late 20s or something and being really terrified by it the first time I read it yeah. and still finding it scary as an adult, but in a, again, in sort of a deeper way, in a way that in this sort of child childhood way or something where, um, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but I, I, I was aiming for that with my book. How can I do that? You know, like if if someone like Neil Gaiman wrote it, he would hit it out of the park. He would know. He would have all the, all the, push all the right buttons. I mean, it's know? still spooky. I tried, and yeah. and you know, the fellow Alistair who who edited the book, was very helpful in helping me, to have some f foreshadowing of things and and create more menace with with the you know the witch character and, um, you know, so. But yeah, so there there were things that I, I tried to do, and I, I think I got pretty close, you know. If you're just tuning in, I'm talking to Ron Sexsmith about his first ever book, Dear Life, uh, D E E R, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, you dedicate this book to your adult kids, and you say you'll forever miss reading them bedtime stories. Was was reading to your kids part of the inspiration for this book? 
Um, yeah, well, I mean, as I got into writing it, you know, because I definitely, I was the kid guy in my in my household. I was the one that took him to the park and would get him to bed and write, re read them their stories and read a lot of fairy tales, read a lot of, obviously, Dr. Seuss and all that kind of stuff, too. But, um, and I, I do miss it. I mean, I just had breakfast with my kids today and they're like, you know, 32 and my daughter's going to be 20, I think 28 on Sunday. That's a scary. Well, it's just so weird because I don't <laughs> feel any different, you know? Yeah. And I'm like 53 now and that's doesn't seem right. You know, I just like, what happened? And um, <laughs> But yeah, at one point there were these little kids and they shared the same bedroom and I really looked forward every night to doing that, you know, to, um, you know, I remember I used to, I, I as a kid I really loved the uh, house on Pooh Corner, you know? And those stories, uh, you know, I still have my original book for, that I got for my seventh birthday, and with the soulful drawings, you know, the original, not the Disney Disney ones, and uh, it was just great to share this book that I loved as kid with my kids, and and um, if they ever have kids, who knows, you know, maybe they'll read my book <laughs> to them, you know, but it was just something that uh, I do miss it, you know. Part of the story is about bullying mm -hmm. and getting revenge. Is, is were you bullied growing up? Uh, the, the worst thing that happened to me was I had a kid hold me over uh, a train bridge once, and my glasses fell off and smashed on the tracks below. That's rough. Yeah. Uh, and there was a few other things. I got punched in the stomach once or something. But, I mean, I was, you know, like Milhouse, what I had glass. I was a sort of proverbial nerdy kid, right? Yeah. Um, but, no, I, I was... I. I didn't have a lot of run-ins like that. There's, that. That's the one that comes to mind. Yeah. So why? So why talk about bullying in this book? Well, I guess the thing with this character Darren, you know, I mean, even the name Darren Headlight, which was like a pun in itself. Which I liked how Dickens would have these characters whose names would sort of describe their nature. Yeah. So, oh, I never caught it. Yeah, Darren oh, Headlight. Come Headlight. on, yeah, yeah. Tom. Come yeah. on, buddy. <laughs> well, yeah, you got to be fast. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> what's I going to say? No, but I, I just, he seemed like a character that just, that would, uh, you know, I mean, that would attract that kind of thing, you know. And, and actually in this book, there's really, there's only kind of one bullying character who's this hunter guy who's a bit of a jerk who, um, he, he doesn't even really bully Darren. He just sort of dismisses him as kind of a joke, you know. But, um, but you know, you have to have these sort of, these characters in a book like that to hopefully create some tension you know and you and you do you do create yeah. tension here ultimately yeah. like when someone picks up the book and and, and reads it and and puts mm. it down is there anything in particular you want them to take away from it um well ho hopefully they like the story you know because i was really even as i was writing it i felt i was reading it you know i was i didn't know how it was going to end i i was i wanted to know how it was going to end mm -hmm. and um yeah, I mean, I, I, hopefully they'll be forgiving because it is my first book, oh, and, okay. and I'm sure my inexperience shows on every page, you know. But I'm very proud of it. I think it's a nice story. I, I, I think that the, at the core of it, it's really about a, a mother's love for her for her son, and I think a lot of people can re relate to that. I want to read a sp from the back from the the author bio here. What do they call that? Do they call that the blurb? Yeah, I don't even know who wrote that, but somebody did. But mm -hmm. it says, um, Dear Life was written mostly on the road during long drives and in dressing rooms and hotel rooms. That's true, yeah. So uh, how did that influence the book, you think? Well, the thing that was great about it was we we were touring America when I started writing it, and, we, and our, our routing was just ridiculous. It was like New York, Nashville, Nashville, Chicago, and so, and, oh, Toronto to New York, first of all. So we had these really super long drives where normally I'd be reading a book. And this time I was in the back of the van typing away. And by the time, you know, I, after, all of a sudden we'd be there, you know, and it just made made the time really fly by. I'm, I'm so surprised because I think when I was on the road, like I found it really, really hard to be creative because <laughs> I just kind of wanted, like I know like Alan Doyle will make an album while he's on the road. Yeah. Like write and record it. I don't, I, like all I want, all I can do is just kind of get to the next gig and do the next thing. I, I've done, I've done that. I mean, I've made an album in the middle of a tour once and I've, I've just found, you know, because in the van there, there are these long patches of where you just sit in there and everyone's sleeping. I can't sleep in a van, so oftentimes I'll uh, even the album I wrote an album for Laurie Cullen with Kurt Swingerman. All those songs were written on tour, because I had nothing else to do but listen to Kurt Swingerman's demos in my headphones and write the lyrics. So 
um, it's just a good time. Um, Killer, I guess. You know. Yeah, no, yeah, nothing like being creative. The yeah. past, it beats a podcast. Yes. The reason I said welcome back to Toronto at the beginning of this interview is Ron Sexsmith. You you just made the move to small town life near Perth. Uh, the Perth, yeah, Stratford, actually, yeah. Yeah, and 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 this story is set in a little community of Hintoven. <laughs> yeah, am I getting that right? Yeah. Actually, one of the towns is named after my wife's last name, which is Hicksonbar. <laughs> which uh, was kind of great to use that in a in a song. What do you I mean, like? In a story. What do you like about small town life? Well, I grew up in a small town, and then for the longest time, I, I lived in a really big city. And uh, like I was saying before the show, you know, I was starting to feel a bit out of place here. Um, maybe it was all in my head, you know, but I started just feeling like, I don't know, I didn't relate to it. I go to the bars that I used to go to, and I didn't know anybody there anymore. Mm. And um, so it was my wife, really, that wanted to leave Toronto. She was over the traffic and all that stuff. And I was sort of kicking and screaming. I didn't, I didn't want to go because of my social scene was here, my friends, my kids. But, um, but she always seems to know what's, you know, what's best for, for some. She has this thing, this inst instinct for that kind of thing. And I've just, I've just find since I've been there, you know, it's only been since March, that I just felt this whole stress cloud evaporate. You really. Know? And I, I don't know what that's about, but it just, you know, there's swans there, you know. And I'm 53, so it just feels like a good place to be at this phase of my life where I'm not old yet, but I'm getting there, you know. And, mm. and it just seems like a tranquil sort of bucolic sort of surroundings, you know. Is it going to make your songs different if, if, if up until now most of your songs were written in an urban setting? Um, I don't think that's ever really played into it. Um, I mean, I've written songs on airplanes and in laundromats and things, you know. I mean, I'm writing now. In fact, I'm writing, I've written 12 songs. This is really insane for a musical based on this book, you know. Oh. That's what I've been doing since I, I moved to Stratford. And I'm meeting with theater people now to help me figure out a way to mount it for the stage because obviously there's animals and things. I don't know how you do that, but <laughs> you can do a lot on the, in theater, obviously, these days. What made you want to do that? What made you want to take this book and... and... Well, because that was my original idea for it. Before it was a book, I thought of it as a movie musical. And, um, and then when I started writing the book, I started thinking, well, well, maybe that could be a foundation for something else, you know. And um, so I've been meeting with... And I'm in the perfect town for it, right? So I'm meeting all these theater people playing them the songs. There was a, th uh, a woman, uh, she's a playwright and a producer that came to my house the other day. I sang the entire musical for her in my living room. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't plan on that. It just sort of worked out that way. And what'd you think? Oh, she was totally into it, and they, they loved the book. And so, you know, we'll see. I mean, obviously, that's a whole other world for making a record. I mean, so many mu musicals probably never see the, the light of day, right? But so right now, that's what I'm... You know, instead of thinking about records, I've been just thinking about how can I do this or, you know. Uh, but obviously I would, I would need help adapting it for the stage, which I, 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 I wouldn't be able to do myself. I think someone would have to do that. Well, Ron, congrats on the book. Thanks for talking about it. It's exciting. I mean, it's a whole new adventure.